Hi de ho, glad you're checking in. I am Bins, and this is part two of my Butt Mam series, in which I'll review my TMAM or TMAM in the laid back factory builder shapes.io. Part one served as an introduction to this series, and I also talked about what distinguishes a regular MAM in this game from a TMAM. So if you missed the first part, be sure to check that out and then come back here. On today's menu, two things. First, I'd like to talk about the five piece approach, which is what my TMAM uses. And then after that, I'll also explain the global logic with which it works. So the ideology behind it, basically. I'd say without further ado, let's dive right in. So what is the five piece approach? Well, let's start off by saying that the term five piece approach is actually already a bit misleading. It would be more accurate to call it four plus one, actually. And you know what? Let's ditch the plus one part and just start off by saying that any shape can be constructed from a maximum of four pieces or components. Just a second, I prepared a little uh, display setup to which we will get if I find it. There it is. So any shape can be deconstructed into or constructed out of four pieces or four components. And these components can come in one of two categories. Both categories uh, contain shapes that can have anywhere between one and up to four quadrants but in one case those quadrants are going to be are all, all going to p pertain to the same layer that's that's one of the cases and in the other case a piece or a component may also have up to four uh, quadrants but on up to four layers as well but only on the condition like this example that there is a maximum of one quadrant per layer and also that all of the quadrants are located strictly and exclusively on one half of the shape. So in this case it's the right half, it could be the bottom half, the left half and the top half. So a piece in the five piece or four plus one or four whatever piece approach is either this on the left, one to four quadrants all on the same layer, or like the example on the right, one up to four quadrants, but only one quadrant per layer and also strictly located on one half of the shape. Now, how do you go about creating this type of shape. I call this like, you know, like a floating layer shape. I have talked about this in, uh, in previous videos, but in case you missed it, I, I would like to go over it again. So I prepared a little, um, a little setup here with just plain good old uncolored circles. Pressing the wrong buttons here. There we go. Good old good old circles and then I also prepared a little uh, coloring setup. This is blue, this is red, and this is green. We are going to want to create this piece right here, okay? The important bit for this floating stack kind of setup is that you are going to need more output, sorry, you need more input, more specifically twice the amount of input that you want your output to have. So if your output has four quadrants in our case, then that, need, then that means I need at least eight quadrants of input. And the reason is because in and of itself, 
we cannot build this particular construction. So what we're going to do is we're going to add extra shapes to the mix and they are going to provide the support. They are going to serve as scaffolding, let's say. So, and the individual pieces of this particular shape, they are going to attach to the scaffolding. The, sc the scaffolding will be built in a way that is independent, you know, stable on its own. And then afterwards, when these shapes attach, we can throw away that scaffolding. We can throw away those additional shapes and we are left with this result. So let's demonstrate live how that works. Um, for scaffolding, you can pick whatever you like. I just pick uh, plain uncolored circles, right? And the important part is that you are going to let a certain part, the part that you're going to use for scaffolding, you need to reuse that in exactly the same corner for all layers. Now, me, my, I as a habit, I tend to grab the, um, the bottom layer and I take the diagonal orientation of that. Let me show you what I mean. So in this case, uh, you see that we need a red on the bottom left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a scaffolding piece on the bottom right. Okay, so I'm going to rotate um, this orientation 180 degrees. And we're going to apply that to all of the layers. That is very important, right? So uh, top left, bottom right, and we are going to use that for all, all of our layers. So we're gonna copy that. And then I'm just going to connect these lines, top left, top right, top left, and top right. That's the way it is supposed to be. And now that we have that, we can very simply just, um, sorry, what's the, I forgot what the hotkey was for uh, the stacker. There we go. Uh, we can very simply stack that and we will get this result. And you will notice, this is a, this is a recurring feature. You will notice that the alternation of the orientations between the lines is always between the quadrants on those lines is always constant. So in this case, I have diagonal, lateral, diagonal, lateral. Now we could have used the bottom left piece for scaffolding as well. In that case, we would have had lateral, diagonal, lateral, diagonal, but either way, this is always going to alternate. This is a recurring pattern that if you start building these uh, floating layer half shapes, um, you're going to start noticing probably. Now, the scaffolding bit um, can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be a gray quadrant. It can be a painted quadrant. It can even be two, quadr qu uh, two quadrants, excuse me. So we could even do that. Let's just see. Do it like so. And we could use, where is it? There. We could use uh, the bottom half. That's absolutely no problem. Keep pressing the wrong buttons, but um, we can also use this for scaffolding, for example, okay? The important part is that the parts we're going to use for scaffolding need to be opposite of the quadrants we want in our actual shape. That is the only really important part. So in this case, we need our top half, and uh, in that case, we can use either or both of the bottom quadrants for scaffolding, right? So this, this would work perfectly as well. Um, but just simple logic commands that, you know, building two pieces for scaffolding is a waste of resources and using one piece for scaffolding works equally fine. If you use only one piece, then the, the, the only important thing to keep in mind is that it needs to be the same orientation for 
all of your layers. So either bottom right for all of the four lanes or bottom left for all of the four lanes. And then once we have that and we notice that we have this lateral diagonal uh, recurring pattern, all we need to really do is just stack these again so that we get these weird looking shapes and we're going to stack that again. And now you can see that this construction is actually already in... Sorry, the, 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 the final piece that we need, this one, it is contained in the outcome we get here. And now the only thing we need to do is remove the gray quadrants, remove our support, remove our scaffolding. Now in this game, as you probably know, uh, the cutter always works vertically, regardless of the orientation. So in this particular case, since we need, the, since we want the top half, we need to rotate this 90 degrees. Then we can cut it. We can throw away the gray scaffolding bit. And since we rotated our shape 90 degrees clockwise, we need to counter rotate it clockwise again, because after all, we do need the top half. And that is how you can create such a piece with floating layers up to four layers or up to four stories high. Now, obviously this is just, uh, you know, the, the physical setup. The challenge in creating a TMAM is obviously that this needs to work, uh, this analysis needs to work with any shape you put in, but obviously we're going to get back to how that works at a later point, okay? Anyway, this is how, um, excuse me, this is how you can do that. Now, the algorithm with which I run my machine is basically, now oh, let's just, Let's keep this, uh, this turned off for now. The algorithm with which this machine runs is that it's going to try, it's going to take the final shape as the input, and from that shape it's going to try and extract pieces like this one. So either four layers, three layers, and two layers. Uh, and while we're at it, I also want to, um, I want to talk about terminology a bit. Um, these types of shapes I tend to use, I tend to call them uh, quad floats. I tend to call these tri floats and I tend to call these duo floats. So if you ever hear me use those words, then that is what that means. Okay, so a quad float is uh, one of these shape pieces four stories high with alternating, um, you know, alternating orientations. A tri float, three layers, a duo float, two layers, etc. So, uh, back to the overall uh, ideology, right? The algorithm. What the algorithm is, uh, trying, is going to do is it's going to analyze which components of these types it can find within the shape. Now, the algorithm I use is, has been called a, a, a brute force approach. And basically what that means is I'm going to I'm going to analyze all of these shape forms. I'm going to line them all up and then I'm going to start trying. You know, if we fit the first piece in, can we construct the final shape? If yes, bingo. If no, try the next combination. If it works, perfect. If it doesn't, next combination. If it doesn't work, next combination, etc. So we're going to try all of these combinations until we get the final shape and sooner or later we will okay that is called the brute force approach now the problem with that is that no hold on there was something else I wanted to say so my machine has modules uh, and we will get back to what the exact modules are but it has modules that for example if it takes this shape okay it's going to find this piece within it, right? This tri float right here, marked in green, it's going to find that and is going to be able to extract that. That's a that's a small sidebar. So um, the problem with this approach is that 
I ran some calculations. With this approach, there are, hold on to your hats. I wrote it down, here it is. There are no less than 16,777,217 different ways of stacking. So that means 16,777,217 candidates that this machine is going to have to try. And as it turns out, You said it, sister. Ain't nobody got time for that. So what I did with my machine is not a, a blunt, brute force approach as such. I like to call it smart brute force. So have a look at these three, these three pieces, okay? Let's assume that we found the first piece within our final shape and we're going to use it as a candidate to try and stack the final shape. It wouldn't ever make sense to combine this candidate with this candidate nor this candidate. Now per definition, if we find this part right here, we're also going to find this part right here and this part right here, because after all, they are components of this shape on the left. And simply because it doesn't, it, simply because of plain logic, it doesn't make sense to use these two in combination because they can never ever make up the correct shape together. You know, if one tri-float or a duo float is found within one of the pieces of a rank higher, then we don't need to take that combination of candidates into consideration. And that's how I managed to bring back, to reduce that incredible number of seven, uh, close to 17, uh, sorry, 17 million possible combinations. I managed to reduce that to, I guess, somewhere around 50, maybe. I guess, worst case scenario, it, it might need to try 50 different combinations before it finds the right thing. And this means that, in fact, this machine, the speed of this machine may greatly vary. Um, it's simply going to try the candidates, and if the machine gets lucky, it finds the right one right away. And if it doesn't get lucky, it might need to try, uh, it might need to try different combinations until it finds uh, the correct one. And in my experience, this may take anywhere between a few milliseconds and up to a minute. And then once it found the correct, once it finds the correct combination of pieces, then uh, it might take about, you know, a minute or so to get the actual shape produced. So up to a minute of analysis stage, and then another, let's say roughly a minute, I think it's a bit less of actual production stage. Now, what is it with the five, with the five pieces, the four pieces, the four plus one pieces? The thing is, we might get five pieces in total, and they will be displayed on the on the bottom line here of my uh, of my display array. We might get five pieces, but only four of them will contain the actual quadrants of the final piece. More specifically a maximum of four of them, because it might also be that the machine can build the shape in less than four pieces, okay? So a maximum of four of them is going to contain the actual quadrants of the shape. And then the fifth uh, piece, the fifth piece might be a fifth layer. Now, I did an entire video about fifth layer stacking. For those who haven't seen it, in a nutshell, it comes down to the fact that even though shapes can only consist of four layers in this game, sometimes it makes sense to use a fifth layer. And just like we spoke about uh, the scaffolding before, you can use this fifth layer as a kind of invisible ceiling to dangle your other pieces from or something, all right? If you would like a more detailed, uh, maybe a more transparent or better explanation, uh, and I invite you to go watch earlier videos of mine about 
about uh, stacking floating layers, etc. Because I explain it more in detail there. But that essentially is uh, what it comes down to. And you know what? I, I think we can wrap it up here. No details about actual setups just yet, but rather a broad explanation about the general ideology behind it all. As of next video, we'll start getting into the specifics of which individual modules there are, how they work, and how they've been set up. And then at an even later stage, we're gonna have a look at how all of those individual modules work together, how they influence each other, and how each one contributes to the bigger picture, which is the five-piece smart brute force approach. So this is it. I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.